Elon Musk, and it's, it is my, my honor and, and pleasure to introduce our speaker uh, today. Elon Musk uh, has uh, insight and drive and experience that uh, way outstrip his years. After University of Pennsylvania and Wharton, uh, he went on to found what really probably were two of the most um, interesting and critical and successful internet and enterprise software related businesses uh, that were ever founded, PayPal and Zip2. He both founded them as well as ran them. Once he got tired with that, uh, he sold them off and uh, turned his attention to space, where he'd always had a strong interest. Uh, and certainly in the last short few years, Elon has become, uh, if not the main symbol, then, then one of the main symbols, but in my mind, probably the main symbol, galvanizing and driving force for the entrepreneurial space industry. So without further ado, since you all know of him well, I'd like to invite and welcome Elon Musk. Wow, that was really kind. Um, all right, so uh, what I thought I'd do is, uh, is kind of whip through a uh, presentation on SpaceX. Uh, some of you are probably aware of the details of what we're doing, and some are probably less familiar. So um, I'll, I'll go through it fairly quickly and, and try to leave as much time as possible for any questions. Um, and uh, you're welcome to ask me you know, any, anything about the rocket or the business. Um, and I, I think I can probably answer just about everything. Um, maybe a few confidential items. Um, can I first slide? So, uh, you know, basically, SpaceX, I, I started SpaceX because uh, it, it, it seemed to me that we weren't making the kind of progress we really needed to make in, in the cost of access to space. Um, and uh, if we don't make cost, I mean, I'm sort of, this is, I'm sort of preaching to a converted here. Um, normally the, the room is not quite as converted as this room is. Um, but, uh, so I'm telling you things you already know, but you know, as long as it costs us hundreds of millions of dollars to put a few people in space, I mean, not even you know, far away space, just um, three or 400 miles above the surface of the Earth, uh, we're never gonna get anywhere. We're not, we're not gonna become uh, a space-faring civilization. And I think probably, I mean, what I, what I really think is, is the overriding goal and what I suspect most people in the room think is, the, is, is certainly uh, is a, is a, an extremely important goal is becoming a space-faring civilization, ultimately uh, becoming a multi-planetary species. Um, and if we're not on that, on that path, then we, we, we really need to get on that path. Um, so uh, given, given that the fundamental obstacle to that is really the cost of, of getting there, they weren't making progress in that direction. That's really why I started SpaceX. Um, and uh, before I actually formally started the company, I put together a group of engineers that have been involved with most of the major rocket developments um, in, in the U.S. and had some familiarity with the way the Russians did it. And in fact, uh, the current NASA administrator, Mike Griffin, was on that uh, fe feasibility study group, so I'm very glad to see he's the new administrator. Um, and uh, we, we, thought of, we sort of sat around over a series of Saturdays uh, in early 2002 and try to figure out, uh, is there anything fundamental? Because I didn't really know anything about rockets at that time. Um, is there some sort of really uh, difficult physical thing that, that makes it fundamentally as expensive as it is and you can't make improvements? And uh, it, it quickly became obvious that there really isn't anything fundamental that prevents uh, chemical rockets from being much cheaper than they are right now. Um, you know, to give you an example, um, the, the propellant cost of the Falcon 1, what it costs to fill the, the, the gas tank essentially, is about $30,000. And that's on a $6.5 million launch uh, initially. We want to keep driving that, that uh, launch cost down. Um, but you know, in, in airlines, that is a dominating factor, uh, often the pr predominant factor in, in cost. Whereas for, for rockets, it's, it's an accounting error. Um, and we need to get to the point where that actually makes, where it's not an accounting error, and actually, unless you have really bad accounting. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's actually, where, where propellant cost actually matters. Um, so, anyway, so the way I usually describe it to people is that uh, the goal is to be kind of like the Southwest Airlines of the uh, space business. 
And when Southwest Airlines came in, uh, airfares were really expensive, and, and Southwest came in off of airfares that were often, you know, 15, 20 percent of what, a, say, United or Delta was, was charging. And people at the time said, well, this, this is really impossible. It must be compromising reliability, or um, there must be something missing with this picture, or they won't be able to sustain those prices. Uh, they've got a business. And you know, the fact of the matter is Southwest Airlines today is uh, the most profitable uh, airline in the, in the industry, has a market cap greater than the sum of all, those, of, it, all of its competitors, um, and it still offers those prices. And, and reliability is good, on-time performance is good. So you know, they went in, they, they really rethought the whole space business. Uh, every ass oh, sorry, <laughs> the whole airline business. And, and so well, that's sort of you know, a good kind of model to, to think of what you know, we're trying to do, is rethink the business of space transportation. Now, we had, I think we've got actually a greater ability to improve in our case, because we're actually driving the fundamentals of the technology, whereas uh, Southwest Airlines could only improve on the service and had to work with an existing technology base of this, you know, the 737. Um, but anyway, that's the basic idea. Um, and I believe in setting objective benchmarks. So, because if, if you can't measure it, it's very difficult to figure out if you're improving. Um, and so the, the benchmark objective is a factor of 10, and to put an actual number on that, it's less than $500 a pound to, to orbit is, is the goal. I, I think we can actually get there before the end of this decade. Uh, so. Um, it's structured like a Silicon Valley technology company because that's how I know how to structure companies. Uh, work, work well the first two times, so hopefully third time as well. Um, and uh, you know, a few common things. There's a very flat hierarchy. It's you know, we're just all in fairly densely packed cubes. Um, we have a, a few fairly small engineering team, but they're really, really the top engineers in their field, and. Uh, uh, we have what I call a, a high signal to noise ratio, where signal is engineering and management is noise. Um, <laughs> and I think th th there's a lot of big aerospace companies have a very bad signal to noise ratio. So, um, and then the, the, the big driver in terms of both reliability and cost improvements is simplicity. Um, so that, that's really our, our mantra at SpaceX. If we can figure out a simpler, easier way to do something, uh, we'll do it. We don't care about whether it's new technology, old technology, you know, doesn't matter. We, we just want to get the job done. Um, our headquarters are in El Segundo, which is about a mile south of uh, LAX, and uh, we have about 75,000 square feet of uh, engineering and manufacturing space. We, we actually build, manufacture the rocket right there in, in LA, um, which is, sounds kind of weird to build a rocket in LA, but we do. Uh, and then we do our propulsion and uh, structural testing in Texas. We have a 300 acre uh, propulsion test facility out there. And I'll show you some pictures of that later in the presentation. Some of the slides, by the way, I'm going to go through pretty quickly. Next slide, please. Uh, so we made pretty good progress. Uh, our third birthday will be next month in June. And uh, so in approximately three years, we've designed the entire rocket from scratch, gone through, designed, designed built, and tested the entire rocket. Both stages, the fairing. Uh, two new engines, including a pump fed engine. Um, and our engine is actually going to be only the second American uh, orbital booster engine developed in, in the past 25 years. The other one being Boeing's Delta IV engine, and before that, the shuttle, the space shuttle main engine. Okay. Um, we, we've managed to get a few launch contracts. Um, uh, two uh, with the, the DOD, uh, and uh, one with the uh, Malaysian Space Agency, and one with uh, a U.S. commercial entity, which is uh, Bigelow Aerospace. Uh, and the last one being uh, the Falcon 5 launch with Bigelow Aerospace uh, being uh, a subscale launch of his space station. So that should be doubly cool. Um, and then we also, you may have seen the announcement that we were awarded a $100 million Air Force IDIQ contract, uh, which hopefully will be used to the fullest extent. Um, and I, I would expect sort of one to two launches a year uh, starting next year on that contract. Uh, it's, I don't know if you saw the, the last, if you head back one slide. Sort of the contrast is, that just looks black to me, but um, 
essentially that prior slide was the uh, our facility when we moved in. This is it one year later. We're assembling a prototype on the floor. And next slide. And then one year after that, uh, the coil vehicle was on the launch pad. Um, and the flight vehicle is actually currently on the launch pad. And uh, we expect to do a, a hot fire on, on the pad uh, tomorrow. So, because uh, Delta Four finally, finally launched, or Delta Two finally launched this morning at uh, 5 a.m. or whenever it was. And uh, so we, we were cleared to do the, the pad hot fire. And uh, then the actual launch should take place as soon as the Titan IV departs Vandenberg, which is uh, in approximately the August time frame, or July, August time frame. Let's see if this works. Uh, if it's not showing up, then the video is not going to play. Uh, anyway, it's just a, a launch simulation video. Uh, if you want to see that video, you can actually just go to our website, spacex.com, and uh, the videos, that video along with uh, a number of other uh, video segments is available. Uh, and we post things regularly there. Uh, I'll skip over the sort of reliability stuff. Um, <laughs> we think it's very important, but uh, <laughs> I think it's very important, but uh, not really trying to sell anyone here a launch, I think. Um, <laughs> But basically, uh, yeah, simplicity is the key to, to both. Um, there's, uh, you know, on the cost side, there are several key technical innovations in propulsion system uh, structures, avionics, guidance control, uh, launch processes. Um, and uh, we're a fairly vertically integrated business. We actually make, literally machine the metal, bend the metal, weld, all that sort of stuff in-house uh, because uh, what I've discovered is that the aerospace supply chain is is so bad that as soon as you as soon as you uh, subcontract any significant portion of that work to to somebody, it uh, it becomes very expensive. Uh, so we've generally found it's more efficient to be uh, vertically integrated than than outsourced. So. And um, so Falcon One uh, capability is. Uh, uh, just over a thousand, like 1,500 pounds to low Earth orbit. Um, the Falcon 5 capability is about six tons. Actually, we'll get to that later. Um, it's uh, it, the optimization in the case of Falcon 1 was really in terms of a cost per flight to orbit. So it wasn't a cost per unit mass optimization. It was uh, what is the smallest useful vehicle that we can build and deliver satellites on, and we concluded that was yet to be at least sort of a thousand pounds to Leo. And uh, we ended up exceeding that, uh, going to about 1,500 pounds. Um, total cost per launch is about six and a half million dollars all in. Both stages, LOX kerosene. Uh, what, one note with the element, actually next slide, uh, is that the first stage is intended to be reusable. It comes back by a parachute to a water landing. The pricing does not include uh, any assumptions for reusability. Um, I'm actually fairly confident that reusability will, will work. Um, provided the parachute opens, I mean, I think <laughs> if, if, if the parachute opens, and I, I, I don't think the seawater is going to hurt the rocket. Um, if you see what it goes through on on the test stand uh, and on the launch pad, uh, where it gets deluged with water, um, high pressure water, and you know, in, in, in our test stand in Texas, I mean, we've had sleet, snow. Uh, rain that's hitting you sideways at 35 miles an hour, um, extremely high winds. So I, I don't. Th I think if it, uh, provided we get get it back, I think it'll actually be uh, require very little refurbishment in order to launch again. Uh, the uh, first stage engine, which we call the uh, Merlin, is um, those are the approximate uh, specifications of it. A lot of this is on the website. Um, but basically, it's a roughly 75,000 pound thrust sea level engine. Um, and 
of, of modest performance. I mean, one of the things that we haven't tried to do is, is try to achieve the highest possible performance. Our goal has been to create something which is a reliable truck, essentially, uh, rather than uh, a Ferrari. Uh, so we, we haven't produced, for instance, a you know, stage combustion, super high ISP engine. This is, you, you need to be pretty good but to, to get to orbit at all, um, but you don't have to be, you don't really have to push the envelope um, any further than we pushed it here. Next slide. Um, our upper stage engine also uh, locks kerosene and uh, similar in architecture to the first stage engine, except that it doesn't have a turbo pump and it's a low pressure engine. Um, so Falcon 5, uh, which is, uh, the Falcon 1 development has really um, been winding down now for the past uh, several months and essentially is almost complete at this point. So the, the development focus for about the past year has been more on the, the Falcon 5, which is our medium lift vehicle. And the Falcon 5 is approximately in the class of a Delta II Heavy. Um, it's also intended to, at least from our standpoint, be safe enough to carry people. Um, it has engine out capability, so you can lose any one of the, the main engines and still make it to orbit. I think that's actually a very important principle, uh, given that uh, Airline transportation, almost all airliners have multiple engines. So if you lose an engine, or you don't go down. Um, and uh, jet turbines are far more reliable than uh, rocket engines. So if that principle makes sense for jet turbines, it really makes sense for rocket engines. Um, and we expect to be able to accommodate up to a five meter fairing uh, as well. So it'll have, you know, really put some pretty big stuff up there. And uh, these are some pictures of our test site. That's a, the, our propulsion test site at night. Next one. Uh, that's our main structural test at Falcon 1. So we actually have a, a, a large steel brace which uh, surrounds the vehicle. And, and the vehicle is um, hydraulically uh, bent and, and crushed at various points uh, to simulate flight loads. Uh, that's a horizontal test stand. That's a picture of a Merlin engine at uh, full thrust. Uh, that's our small vertical test stand where we test the upper stage engine. And that black pipe there is a diffuser which helps simulate vacuum conditions. So, uh, it's uh, vertical test stand two, which is another picture of Merlin in the vertical configuration. Uh, and that's our really big test stand. Um, and that's capable of uh, testing uh, basically th uh, thrust levels up to about three million pounds. So that, that test stand runs about 100 feet into the air, 70 feet underground, um, and we hope to use that to its fullest capacity and, and maybe beyond. So th that'll be exciting. And the, the R in it stands for rocket. <laughs> so is there a, so any questions I can answer? Oh, um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I think the, uh, what, what is the throw weight of Falcon 5 to Mars? Um, well, it depends on which trajectory. I mean, the, the, zero three, the, the zero C3 number, as I recall, is about uh, 1,200, 1,200 kilograms, something like that. Uh, yeah, it's like about a ton, a little over a ton. I mean, basically, it's about as capable as the Delta II Heavy is that sent the Mars Exploration Rovers there. Um, so any, anything that Delta II could throw to Mars, uh, Falcon 5 could throw to Mars. Um, could, you know, couldn't really send people if they were alive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> need something much bigger than that. Um, but you could certainly do uh, robotic missions. Uh, sure. Um, we don't like to disclose too much ahead of time because, uh, well, frankly, we'd like to. It's more a question of sound incredible than anything else because uh, we'd like to get some things accomplished before we claim we're going to do other things. Um, but uh, the plan is um, to do a vehicle which is in the class of uh, Delta IV uh, after Falcon 5. Um, 
and uh, you could you could apply sort of a common booster core approach to that, and uh, you know encompass the entire range of the, the ELB capabilities. It's so up to about sixty thousand pounds to to orbit, maybe a little beyond that. Um, I, I can't say that we'll we'll be announcing something fairly significant later this year, as far as much more lift capability than than is currently represented. But we'd like to I, I, ideally I'd like to have Falcon One launch before we make a, any big announcement in that direction. Um, but you can expect that from a strategy standpoint, we're, you know, call it the 7-Eleven strategy. You know, we're going small, medium, large, and extra large. Um, or big golf or whatever it is, super big golf. Um, so, we're, you know, Falcon 1 is obviously small, Falcon 5 is medium, we'll have it large and extra large. Sure, actually, it's back there. How much has the range impacted, the range has impacted your cost of development? Um, I, I think um, range-related stuff is probably, I mean, all regulatory stuff combined, I'd say at most 25% of the cost. I mean, it's still, it's, you know, 20 to 25% of the, of the total cost so associated with both development and launch. Um, you said the first days were usable. I noticed you still have um, uh, a blade of yeah. Oh, it's it, yeah. It, 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 the the ablative portion is actually really cheap. I mean, it's it's uh, it costs less than one of our main valves on the engine. Um, so uh, I want to give away sort of really detailed proprietary numbers, but I can say it's really de minimis. I mean, it it costs us more to hire the tugboat to go out there than it does to replace the ablative. Sure. Um, and, and by the way, uh, you know, we put out a. I put. I write a little update every three or four months. I've been waiting to get the hot fire done before doing the, the next update. Um, the uh, the hot fire that we're planning to do, which hopefully will take place tomorrow, um, it was originally supposed to take place on May third, uh, and then we had a, <coughs> an igniter sensor failure, which we lost that day, and then we have to go behind the Delta two, and so it goes on. Anyway, but it's supposed to happen tomorrow uh, around. Uh, around 1 o'clock um, Pacific time. Uh, and it's going to be a, a complete uh, launch simulation, including about five seconds of flame on the, on the ground. Um, five seconds feels like a long time if you're there, by the way. <laughs> um, then uh, as far as uh, uh, the actual launch date, um, we think we'll be ready to go as soon as uh, the Titan IV departs, which is currently scheduled to be around mid-July. Um, so, and, and that's, there's a contingency there both on the, on the Titan IV rocket as well as the payload, which is a Class V payload. Um, and so we, we only have limited visibility into that because they won't, they won't give you specifics when there's classified stuff involved. Um, but uh, we expect, assuming that they launch in mid-July, we, we expect the range would give us um, a launch, because the range, the range has to assign a launch day to us. Uh, we assume the range would assign a launch day that is within within two or three weeks of, of the Titan IV departure. So therefore, if Titan IV left, you know, I'd say basically August would be a good bet. Um, and then um, as far as Kwajalein, that's actually going uh, very well. We have our own little island there called Amalek. Um, and uh, it's, um, the, the concrete is uh, all, you know, I think the last bit of concrete is, is getting poured next week. Uh, so all the concrete for the pads and the uh, propeller storage and the uh, vehicle hangar and all that sort of stuff is almost all done. Uh, we expect to have that launch site uh, active and, and ready to do something with uh, in, the, in the late August time frame. So if time four gets significantly delayed, uh, then we'll go out of Kwajalein. And we, we expect to actually have two rockets, one, one at Vandenberg, one at Kwajalein, possibly on the pad at the same time. I actually love your comment about why you are doing so much work internally. It just speaks volumes about how the aerospace industry is not struggling to support new entrepreneurial space companies. And, and my question to you is I presume you are reaching out to a lot of suppliers who are really not part of the space industry. And I'm curious, they basically, for the first time, you're the first space company that's ever asked them to. 
Uh, that's a good. The, actually, we try not to tell anyone outside the space business that's for a rocket because they assume rockets are made of magic. So, <laughs> so you know, if you tell them it's for a rocket, they go like, "Well, you know, I don't think I'm quite good enough to do something for a rocket." And they're like, "No, it'll be fine." Um, <laughs> uh, so we, we generally, uh, I mean, th there are some uh, suppliers that, or aerospace suppliers that do do a good job. Uh, I'd say like uh, Barada valves does, does a good job, for example. Um, Spincraft does a good job of spinning domes. You know, there's, there's a few, so I don't want to sort of paint all aerospace supplies with, with, with the same with negative brush. Um, I think there are definitely some good ones out there. Um, but uh, generally, we find, uh, uh, as a principle, that uh, regular industrial suppliers, if, if you want something cheap, fast, and it's probably going to work, then you should use a regular commercial supplier. If you want something that's expensive, takes a long time, might work, uh, use an aerospace supplier. <laughs> Just to follow on to his question, are there any test facilities at NASA like wind tunnels or rocket test stands that you anticipate needing for your future work? Uh, so are there, are there any NASA test facilities that we anticipate needing for our work? Um, it's possible uh, you know, when we get to the really big um, propulsion stuff that uh, we'd want to use some of the NASA test facilities. Um, you know, as a general rule, um, you know, we don't want to be the ones begging to use facilities. So if if if, uh, if we're going to use a NASA facility, then that that NASA facility has to behave like we're the customer. If they don't behave like we're the customer, we're not going to we're not going to work uh, work there. Um, and uh, you know, if we have to sort of justify why we want to work there, we're definitely not going to work there. Um, so uh, you know, I think. Just for, for pace of execution reasons, um, because there's also a lot of paperwork involved with using NASA facilities, uh, we've chosen to use our own facilities. Um, but I, I think, like I said, for, for big stuff or, or where, you know, where that's you know it's like one of a kind sort of test facilities, uh, that's uh, that's probably where it makes sense to work work with NASA as far as using test facilities. Uh, sure. It's, well, it's actually on the website. Uh, it's uh, uh, basically it's about uh, 15.8 15 million plus about a million in range-related fees. So you can say 17 all in, and that's for a Delta II heavy class vehicle. That's about 12,000 pounds. Uh, a little more than that. Yeah, about 13,000 pounds. So it's a little it's a little more capability than a Delta II heavy. Uh, no, we, I mean, we've signed Falcon 5 uh, to be, it's actually consistent with the NASA manned standards for, uh, uh, you know, as far as safety margins and all that are, are concerned. It actually exceeds them in most cases. Um, and I think the fact that it's, this engine out redundancy is, uh, you know, is good as well. Um, the G loading is certainly uh, fine. It's, you know, maxes out at 5 Gs approximately. Um, so, uh, you yeah, know, I don't think there's any, any issue with, with putting people on it. the conference and the National Space Society, we really want to thank you for your talk and being here with us today and accept this memento on our, on our behalf. Thank you very much.